Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This video will be a new story called Crossing the River Gates. All credit goes to the author, Airhead Dude, for their amazing story. Make sure to read the whole story by clicking the link tree link in the description, then clicking on the name of this story. This part will be chapter 1, 2 of the story. Also don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe. Now let's get into this amazing story. A bleak and incomprehensible nightmare was what he would describe as the event that would come to be known as the Fourth Shinobi World War escalated to such unholy proportions that he couldn't make sense of what was going on anymore. Hataki Kakashi, General of the Third Division, watched in absolute shock as he saw the countless and overwhelming numbers of the clone army made up of Zetsus popping up from nowhere. By the time they had realized it, they were already surrounded and had to resort to survival tactics rather than offensive ones. At first, they stood up to the amassing Zetsu army that simply rushed at them blindly. They were relatively weak and had almost no fighting ability, but they made up for it in the form of sheer numbers. The attacks continued at random intervals, and the push became long and tedious. Every single time they tried to break through a line, it took days to get there. The medical and logistics divisions were already exhausted, carrying and healing the injured as they pushed through the border of hot spring country. Shizun's team was responsible for taking decommissioned and non-combatants alike from the field, and they were also responsible for relaying supplies. As the battle progressed, Shizun's team would be constantly mobile, moving their supplies from one location to another, all the while some travel back to Lightning Country to obtain more aid and supplies. Kakashi had noticed that as the war continued, morale was slowly being diminished. Slowly being consumed by this conflict, men and women were dying left and right. Fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, and siblings were dropping like flies as they pressed on. The ambush team hadn't been lucky. Only two members managed to survive the first battle with the undead. Sai was repositioned to another ambush team along with Kenkuru. It was the most disastrous operation of the war to date coming from the Alliance. They were the first to encounter them. At first, he had been cautious, wary of the army that Kabuto had resurrected. As they continued on, it became harder and harder to press on to where Madara's base of operations lay. When they finally did get there, it was then that the nightmare finally appeared in full force. The army of the living dead appeared before them. All of them were ninja renowned in their time. People that had made claims to fame because of their power and abilities and the danger that they possessed. It was as if it was taken from a page of a horror novel. It took a lot of soldiers just to fight and restrain one. Nagato and Itachi, in particular, were incredibly difficult to put down. They were immortal super soldiers. They had enough power to wipe out a single village or country. Kakashi bore witness to the nightmare that plagued them for weeks. It took the new ambush team, now comprised of Niji, Sai, Kenkuru, Ino, Shino, and Sakura, the same amount of time that they had to endure to locate Kabuto and trick him into ending the technique. Though Ino and Sakura had a hard time inducing the Jinjutsu to Kabuto, who was by no means a fool when it came to illusions, they pulled it off and rescued Enko even if it almost killed all of them. When they thought that the path was clear to the final base, then he appeared. Now clad with the eternal Manjikyu, Sasuke gave that psychotic grin as he began running down from the mountain before stabbing the black and white Zetsu, who was holding him back from the front lines. The Uchiha was impatient. He noticed how eager Sasuke was in decimating their forces and delivering a very devastating blow to a dwindling army. The boy was stopped midway in his run though when Naruto had suddenly intercepted Sasuke out of nowhere in a flash of yellow light. Wrapped in a yellow-like aura, the blonde wordlessly stared at Sasuke as his Susano began to form. A slip-up from Killer B had him running from Turtle Island to the battlefield for days. Naruto had finished his training with Killer B, who had no choice but to divulge the whole thing about the war to him and why he was being kept on the island. He went on his own, charging through the ranks like an indomitable force of nature, too fast and too powerful to stop. It did not sit well with Naruto about the whole thing. So once and for all, he wanted to put an end to every ministration, every machination, every plan that Madara has had in store. It was time to put a stop to this madness, once and for all. Up into the side of Mountain's graveyard, Uchiha Madara watched in silent anticipation as Naruto and Sasuke faced each other in battle. He sat on one of the rocks situated by the side as his army of Zetsus battled against the main force of the Shinobi Alliance. Thanks to Kabuto and his army of undead zombies, the war became much easier on his side. With wiping out almost half of the Alliance's fighting force and a few members of the army remaining, Kabuto had been a useful tool. The gray-haired medic managed to incapacitate Tsunade, lured her into a state of shock and frustration when she saw her lover. 
but was momentarily taken aback by the former rakage, and was almost killed thus almost costing the alliance the entire campaign and ultimately resulting in B's capture. He was so useful that Madara was more than wary of the man. The former right-hand man of Orochimaru knew a lot about him. He knew his secrets, and with him gone, it would be a secret that he assured would not get out. Madara had to admit though, Kabuto knew his way with screwing with people's minds. Many of the shinobi Kabuto resurrected were deeply connected with certain people like the Rakage and B's father, or Dan and Tsunade. The man was so good at psychological warfare that the organization of the alliance easily crumbled to something so trivial like connections to a loved one. He looked to the other side and saw the different divisions, or what's left of them, were once more clashing with his army of Zetsus. The struggle was now in a stalemate, but Madara wasn't interested in it. He was much more interested in the two below. The rapidly dwindling numbers of the army from both sides indicated that the war was on its last legs. A sign of things finally coming to an end, Madara watched as Naruto and Sasuke, Uchiha and Uzumaki, face off and triggered the climax of this war that would decide the fate of the entire world. Madara smiled beneath his mask. A new age was dawning upon them, and he would be the one to open the gates of this new world. Idolas. Faust looked over his majestic city in deep contemplation. It had been years since his son's disappearance, years of looking for a way for his kingdom to survive without obtaining magic. The old king looked at his city, as questions began littering his mind while looking below at the ignorant citizens of this grand and powerful kingdom. How much longer would the magic last in this world? How much magic would Anima obtain and convert into power? How many years would it take to power the city? As these questions continued to play into his mind, Faust turned his gaze from below the common folk to up above in the heavens, where a floating island lay still over his precious capital. He scowled. His complacency turned into a silent but inconceivable rage. The Exceed had always been a race of creatures internally born with magic. Therefore, they sought it fit to be considered as beings higher than anyone in this world. These creatures, no better than the common house cat, looked down upon them. They, who had been providing magic to this dying world, judged them from such an arrogant location with their noses held high below them. Faust would show them. He would show them that these creatures and their queen were nothing more than a farce. They weren't gods or angels. They were creatures born of luck due to their magic. He gave a small yet sinister smile as he looked towards the heavens and saw the small speck that housed the exceed. Certainly, every magic in this world would belong to his kingdom and only to him. This is what it should be, for the dawn of a better world. Faustama, our mages have begun testing the anima, and they would like you to oversee the initial test results. Faust turned his back towards one of his most loyal subjects, Urza Nightwalker, the fairy hunter. Sadistic and cruel, Nightwalker wouldn't hesitate to kill anyone who goes against the interests of the capital, or to put it bluntly, the interests of the king. Her fierce loyalty and efficiency towards the royal army earned her a fearful yet begrudging respect among her peers. Faust turned his back from the balcony and wordlessly left the room as his most loyal knight remained genuflect. As the king stepped into the room that housed Anima, he looked around at his mages with his expectant gaze as he looked at the very core of the machine itself. What is it that you have to report? He asked. He knew that the anima was the perfect tool. The blasted exceed had said so. One of our workers has found a strange anomaly in anima's magic detecting radar, sire. It's picking up large bursts of magical power outside of the usual coordinates we have set up to gather magic from. It is quite a discovery. We have never seen such strong magical fluctuations that are attracting this strange phenomenon. The one that reported to him adjusted his glasses and looked at the chart showing large, sharp angles and graphs as he continued further. We are currently attempting to track it down and see just how strong it is, your majesty. If we can get a lock on its coordinates, we could possibly extract enough magical power to last us for more than a hundred years. Faust's eyes widened at this sudden turn of events. He stood unresponsive for a few seconds before giving a small chuckle turning into full-blown laughter as the news finally hit home. I see. Make sure we obtain it. I want that much magic as soon as possible. Faust mentioned as he watched in anticipation and glee for what was to come next. Much like a child anxiously awaiting his gift, Faust looked on in intense fascination, in absolute excitement as he waited for the magic to appear in this world. In silent trepidation, Faust had hoped that everything would go smoothly. There was nothing the hand of anima cannot reach, or at least, that's what they thought. Sir, we have a lock on the coordinates that anima has detected earlier, but it seems it is rather too far for us to fully extract that much energy for us.
Faust's excitement turned to anger as he gripped the railings as hard as he could. What do you mean Anima is too far to reach it? What kind of foolishness does this enact? There is nothing unreachable for the hand of Anima. The subordinate stopped in fear of the king's wrath. He watched as King Faust hurriedly went over to him as much as his frail body took. The king of Idolos growled in silent rage as he went over to the man. I'm sorry, your highness, but it is exactly as what it says. The magic needed to absorb that much energy and the distance of the object requires magical energy to likes of which we don't currently have. I would dare say it would be impossible to. Silence. Faust commanded as he slammed his hand onto the wooden desk. Your Majesty, I'm sorry to intrude, but indeed this man is right. An arm placed on Faust's shoulders as the mage said to him while holding the book. Indeed, it is impossible to transfer all of it. However, might I suggest something of a substitute to bringing it closer, my lord? The mage asked, to which the king calmed down and looked at the mage with that flat look of his. What do you have in mind? A fractional transfer of putting such a level of magic in a different plane before doing it again for the actual extraction, granted. It would take us months to restore anima to its same power as it is today, but it would assure us of near limitless magical energy for the city and the empire for years to come once we gain this much energy. Faust grew impatient at this. He almost tasted the cusp of his plan when he heard of how much magic they would be able to extract only to find out that the place that had attracted anima was too far and too impossible to extract all. I don't care. I just want that magic here, was all Faust could say as he turned back from the group. The king of Idolos walked away in dismay and was clearly upset. He had sunk his fangs too deep into this incident, but it would not deter him, for it would only be a few months from now before he could fulfill his one wish to restore and create an order in the new world, with his kingdom at the helm. Faust sat on his throne once more, with that complete look of disappointment etched on his face. The man put a palm on his face before sighing and finally called for one of his elite soldiers. Night Walker. And just on cue, the fairy hunter appeared before him, emerging from the shadows that littered his empty hall. Gather your men and begin collecting magic from the outlawed curs that still use magic. Purge the lot of him and send their weapons to me once you are done. The redhead bowed deeply and excused herself from his presence. Faust's hands were trembling in fists of pure rage at this. Such a foul mood deserved an equal appeasement. With naught but a silent room in his hall, Faust mumbled once more about his ambitions for the kingdom and all the power he will obtain to bring down those pompous and arrogant exceed. They were no gods, and he shall prove it, once and for all. Mountain's Graveyard The clash of two long rivaling foes, connected together by a bond of mutual hatred, of ancient feuds tracing back to the origin of all ninjas, has finally taken center stage as the curtains open for a new dawn. Naruto and Sasuke, brothers in arms yet pitted against one another. The cruelty of fate had never been clearer than the intertwined fates of these young men, cursed for events out of their hands, taken to extremes of plunging both into an abyss of hatred created by ninjas of the past. One of them eventually had their sanity taken and driven off to the edge of the darkest and deepest pit. They watched in trepidation and anxiety as the last of the Uzumaki faced off against the apparent last of the Uchiha. Faced in this never-ending struggle, the world watched as the skies gave way to dark gray clouds and wept. The mourning of the world for the tragedy that would befall in this time would be forever carved into history, the day friends and brothers faced off against one another in a battle to the death. Once the signs of battle between Naruto and Sasuke had commenced, Sakura had abandoned her post in order to go after the two to see it through to the end, to stop this madness once and for all. Wait, Sakura. Get back here. Kenkuru shouted at the girl as the leader of the ambush squadron tried to get the Kunoichi, only to be stopped as soon as the pink-haired girl shouted, I'm sorry, I have somewhere to be. I'll accept whatever happens to me later. Kenkuru cursed his luck and clicked his tongue. He looked over to his other members and saw that all of them had this longing expression towards the general direction where Sakura went. The puppet master sighed at this. Going out of formation would severely destroy our coordination, and I've been meaning to take down Uchiha Sasuke anyway, so it's best that we take him on as a group rather than alone. The members of the ambush squadron all nodded at him. Kakashi sought after them along with Guy, taking with him the remaining members of Naruto's classmates and peers, Hinata, Shikamaru, Lee, Tintin, and Kiba, along with the logistics officer, Shizen, and the only surviving member of the first recon team, Anko. With a wave of sand, Gara had managed to push through the front lines for Kakashi and the rest to go through. You have some place where you ought to be, 
Go there and be Naruto's support. I am sure he is tormented by the fact that he is facing his blood brother. Go. I will provide you with the necessary cover. If Madara so happens to intervene, Naruto will have the necessary people to defend him at his most vulnerable. Kakashi nodded at this as he and the rest followed suit. Gara watched as they charged through the enemy line in swift motion, all the while remaining silent and motionless while standing on his sand cloud. To his right, the Tsuchikage floated safely above the chaos as he said to Gara, Do not delude yourself, Kazakagadano. The old man looked below and unleashed a molecule crushing technique that destroyed several clones. I can see from your actions that you want to join them as well. Do you wish not to go? Gara could only give a small reply. I have a duty here to protect and follow through with the words that Uzumaki Naruto left behind for me. As the commander of the Allied Shinobi forces, I will be the one to wait for Uzumaki Naruto as a friend and will be the one to tell him to stand once more. That's what friends do. But Tsuchikage simply grinned at this and asked the fifth Kazakage, How could a simple genin give so much faith, Kazakagadano? Gara's eyes merely trailed towards the dwindling armies of white Zetsus below as he replied, You do not understand, Tsuchikage Dano. You have yet to meet one such as Uzumaki Naruto. Perhaps if you do meet him, you will see why I'm so indebted to him. As the battle waged forth for the last stand on Mountain's graveyard, none of them noticed the dark clouds above swirling in dark haze as thunder boomed and lightning crackled. Boom! Naruto? Sasuke mumbled as he stared at his former teammate, now shrouded in that yellow chakra of his. He moved too fast for his Sharingan to see, as if watching mirages of the boys circling around him. It wasn't like it was back then. Back then, he was the superior one in speed. Back then, he took advantage of the fact that he was faster than the dobe. But now, it was different. Naruto was the slippery one. Almost impossible to touch, or even nick. Not only that, he hit as hard as ever. Against what seemed like an impenetrable wall of defense in Susano's favor, Naruto was able to bypass it and punch him right across the face, sending him flying from his recent position. You were always an eyesore. Sasuke mumbled as he got up, his eternal Manjikyu coming to life as he dusted himself off from the debris. Naruto scowled at the man he once called a brother. The moment they finally met once more was the moment they would put this thing to rest. Are you done? He asked. Sasuke merely scowled as the blonde crouched down, itching for this very moment. Talking is over. This time, I come for real. You don't know how much I would like to beat the crap out of you. Their fists itching to punch one another, adamant and striking their opponent down, shook violently as they clashed once more, their punches echoing throughout the morose and desolate landscape. Their harrowing force sent shockwaves as former friends fought their battle, letting all pent-up anger and emotions fly off the handle. Once the people from the ambush team and Kakashi's team arrived on the spot, they saw clouds of smoke rising from multiple areas. Craters littered the ground as the two fought their battle at an immense pace. Look at those two go. It's almost hard to detect even with the Sharingan, Kakashi muttered as he watched the saddening but awe-striking event. So why are we just sitting around here? We need to take down the Uchiha as soon as possible. Ever the captain of the ambush squadron, Kenkuru, began to unravel one of his scrolls when he felt a hand grasping his shoulder. I'm afraid I can't let you do that. The puppet master turned his head to the side and slowly met the man wearing the orange mask, the one who claimed himself to be Uchiha Madara, patriarch of the Uchiha clan, betrayer of the leaf. Bastard. Kankuru was about to respond when Madara simply pushed him away with a repulsion blast. Shinra Tensei. Kankuru was suddenly thrown off from his position and sent hurtling toward the mountainside, crashing into the earth. Everyone looked surprised at the sudden display of power coming from the man. Impossible. The only person to have that kind of repulsion technique is? Kakashi was immediately cut off. Pain. Am I correct? Granted, it wasn't easy to obtain this eye. I lost my left eye and right arm to Conan before I managed to kill her. I've grown much, much stronger than the last time you saw me. So do your worst. I am no doubt going to kill all of you. The Kanoha ninja instantly backed away from the man as they each jumped out of range from him. Madara barely moved an inch as they seemed to size him up considerably. You all know the timing of using his repulsion technique, correct? Kakashi asked, to which all of them nodded. Good. If any of us can give enough openings for any of us to make a clear shot, make sure you all make it count, Kakashi mentioned, and once more, all of them nodded. Taking into account his phasing ability, I wouldn't be so sure of harming him entirely just like that. He's far too slippery for me to capture, Shikamaru mentioned as he scratched the back of his head. 
He grabbed a kanai tied with a long line of string and explosive notes and stretched it firmly from his hand. Jinjutsu wouldn't work as well. He has the Sharingan, so consider illusions out of our limited choices, Eno continued. To this, Madara laughed slightly and took a small step forward. Do you honestly think that you can manage to land a hit on me with just you people? Do you think you can take me on now that I have the power of the Rakuto Sinin? This time, Madara laughed out loud as the Kanoha Shinobi watched in contempt. Don't speak so highly of yourselves. Madara's mood changed immediately from amused to serious as he stretched out both his arms at them. Know the difference between me and you lot. Madara's features darkened and started to build up the necessary chakra for a powerful enough Shinra Tensei to wipe them and the army at their backs that was slowly making its way toward them. Niji and Hinata's Byakugan instantly could tell the magnitude of the technique he was about to do and immediately told everyone to take down Madara immediately. From the distance where Naruto and Sasuke fought, the blonde could immediately feel the spike of sudden killing intent. From what he could feel, the enormous chakra being gathered stopped him in his tracks and evaded Sasuke's oncoming swipe of his chikudo and countered with a powerful straight punch to his jaw, sending him crashing into the mountain wall. Naruto immediately turned around and dashed his way toward the site where he could feel the spike of chakra, forcing him to feel like a balloon ready to burst when he finally noticed something. The skies above had been looking restless for a long while. The clouds briskly moving in a fashion similar to the swirl in his jacket suddenly alarmed him when the spiking levels of chakra began bombarding his senses like hammers to a nail. Naruto staggered as he fell down, completely taken off guard by the sudden invasion of chakra pouring out from everywhere he could feel. The earth, the water, and even the air he breathed felt like a large amount of condensed chakra at a single spot. D. Naruto. Sasuke menacingly leapt at the blonde, drawing Kusanagi from his arms and using a reverse grip over his head, thinking of stabbing the blonde straight to the heart. Naruto looked back as he saw Sasuke about to strike him and braced himself to catch the blade as he shouted, Don't count me out yet, bastard. It's over. Madara announced as he took a deep breath and let out a huge wave of repulsion against his opponents that could do nothing to take him down. CHOU Shinra Tensei, ultimate subjugation of the omnipresent being, the strong gravitational force forced its way towards the group as the ground beneath the ancient man caved in and formed a crater. The trail of dust and debris soon raced all around the area, lifting and hurtling anything away from Madara and lifting everything within sight at point-blank range. As Madara watched solemnly at the destruction that he caused, he had failed to notice that many of the ninja that stood at his front were not within point-blank range. Inside the very mountain itself, the demonic statue of the outer realm shook violently as a shrill cry escaped from its mouth. The earth trembled from the inhuman roar that escaped as its eyes began to shake. Down below, past where the cells of the first Hokage and Yamado are assimilated, the very root of the statue began to violently shake from the phenomenon. In a matter of seconds, the swirling clouds of gray rapidly opened up and revealed a white luminous light while the force of Madara's jutsu, taking with it a huge chunk of the Alliance forces and the army of Zetsu clones, torn away and visibly battered by the forceful gravitational repulsion. The earth suddenly trembled, and Madara lost his balance for a moment. The man looked down and saw several fissures forming beneath him, spreading slowly but surely all around him. His eyes widened at the realization of the possible consequence of what might just happen. Madara looked up and saw trees and debris rising from the ground, going upwards towards that blinding white light. He could see people going up as well, being dragged to whatever that thing was. Madara scowled beneath his porcelain mask. He saw the son of the fourth Hokage being dragged upwards, towards that thing. With his hand outstretched, he summoned forth another of the Rakuto Sinin's miraculous powers. Bansho Tenin gathering of creation. Up above, Naruto's peers and known superiors looked at the scene of what was to happen. Naruto was about to be pulled towards Madara when Anko suddenly began forming hand seals. With an outstretched hand, she let go a plethora of snakes from her sleeves and with them, tightly grasped Naruto by coiling their bodies around him. Oh no you don't, Sinii Jashu, hidden snake hands. The only surviving member of the recon team then pulled the blonde with all of her might as Naruto relinquished the QB's chakra back. The gravitational force of attraction missed when Anko changed Naruto's position and sent the boy to the very top. The sudden bombardment of his senses felt like he was being tortured for several days. The unbearable pain somehow numbed his body down. Down below, the ghetto Mazo was finally unplugged from below and Madara could visibly see the head slowly making its appearance known. 
The madman growled at this as the heretic statue finally rose from its earthen prison. No. I won't let this happen. I won't waste my work that took almost a century. The earth soon gave way as the ghetto Mazo bulged from the ground and rose into the sky. Madara reached far out into the distance where ghetto Mazo was, as finally, the white light above brought forth streams of it like cascading waterfalls. It began to literally scoop up everything in it. Madara then jumped, his only remaining piece was way up into the sky, far-reaching than anyone else. Just then, like a whirlpool's vortex, the stream of light sucked everything to its epicenter, leaving behind nothing as it sucked anything and everything it could reach. And just like that, as to when the strange object appeared it disappeared just as abruptly. Deep forest. The skies darkened all over Fiori on this day, where the clouds signaled forth a harrowing storm, as rain slowly began to pelt the ever-fertile lands, for people found themselves slowly waking up from a seemingly real nightmare. What happened? A voice asked. From the tone of the voice, it became apparent that it was female, perhaps already mature in terms of growth. Something from the sky sucked us in. It's most likely that whatever it is, it was meant as a transportation type of jutsu. The question is, where did it send us, and more importantly, where did it send the others? The second one asked, low, calm, and collected. Judging from the tone, it was male. That's not the only thing I've noticed, Kakashi. The woman said as they stood up, causing the bushes to rustle. What I'm more concerned about was that statue, Uchiha Sasuke, and that masked man. They were sucked by that thing too, if I recall. The woman said as Kakashi nodded. A worst-case scenario would be if Naruto were sent with one or the other. Kakashi helpfully mentioned. You can alleviate your youthful selves from such thoughts. Another voice shouted, and this time. A man in green leaf green spandex and a green vest, to his waist was tied the symbol of the alliance, the mark of a united front. Orange leg warmers were placed on each of his legs, and a pair of blue sandals was his footwear. The two, however, were more interested in the bundle of orange and black that he was carrying. Lucky us, we have Naruto for now. That means the war is still stalled, Anko mentioned, and Kakashi nodded. Yes, but who knows for how long. As it is now, with Naruto Kuen knocked out like this, we can't possibly go searching for any of our students or Shizun, let alone fight Ichiha Sasuke and Madara. Guy mentioned this with a frown, and Anko asked a question. What happened to him anyway? I can't give out a full diagnosis of Naruto's current condition. I'm not a medic neen like Sakura or Shizun. But if I had to guess, it would be sensory overload. The amount of chakra that I felt during that moment before being sucked in was so enormous, and the discharge that Madara was sending was no laughing matter either, Kakashi mentioned and then added helpfully. The fact that Naruto was at the dead center of that vortex and the fact that he has a high sensory ability when he's in that form says a lot about what would have happened. So what do you propose we do? Anko asked, and Kakashi put his hands in his pockets. Since we're not in immediate danger, we'll just have to keep a low profile for now. We'll need a basic grasp of where we landed. A small town should suffice for us to linger for a few days while Naruto is asleep. Once he recovers, then we'll see what we can do from there. That is, if it's okay with you too, since we can't possibly be moving with an incapacitated member on our side. Well, you're the commander, and it's better than nothing. I'll be the one to gather the needed info as to where we are. Then we can pan out from there. I'll also see if the villagers saw one of our brats or Shizun, or in a worst-case scenario, Sasuke or Madara. If by chance either one of those two or both of them are in town, well, it's been nice knowing you. I'll come back within six hours. In the meantime, you guys stay put. If I don't come back by then, you'll know what to do. Anko said this and put her hands at the back of her head as she walked away. Kakashi stopped her for a moment there and reminded the only surviving member of the recon team. Anko, no drastic measures, you got that? No unnecessary killing. Anko turned her head to the copy ninja with a smirk and asked him, What do you take me for? Kakashi shook his head with a sigh and turned to Guy. Guy, we'll be discussing some escape plans on our own if Madara and Urasasuke are here and some ways to get in contact with our students. For the meantime, we'll be stuck with Anko gathering the necessary information while we set up camp. Guy nodded and laid Naruto on the side of a tree. With a seal, Kakashi created a shadow clone and ordered it to gather some firewood and sticks to set up as a makeshift tent while the green-clad Jounin collected huge leaves and clean water. Kakashi gave a sigh as he sat by his blonde student. It's times like these that I wish Tenzu were with us. A shame that Kohai of mine was captured, Kakashi lamented briefly as he looked at the sky of dull gray clouds. Another cloudy day. Another name to mourn. Somehow, Kakashi felt hopeless right now. Someplace else. 
Slowly drifting into consciousness, his blurred vision began to regain clarity as he looked up. The last thing he remembered was the hand of Kabuto reaching towards his face. Yamato confirmed that he was possibly rescued and felt a throbbing headache escape. The captain rose up and flinched slightly as a familiar voice was immediately within earshot when he groaned. He's awake. A woman's voice and some of the people around him began to mumble. Yamato Taishu, thank goodness. Shizen announced as he looked around. The Unbo captain saw Niji standing by a tree and Chuji by the side. To his right, he saw Shino and Sai who were sitting on the ground and looking at the scrolls, most likely doing an inventory check. Where? We don't exactly know, Yamato Taishu. How we got here is a story crazy enough in itself. I would have asked Niji-san or Shino-san to do some scouting for us, but in our current situation, we can't afford it right now with you injured, Shizen mentioned this while running her glowing hand on Yamato to run a diagnosis. Tantan was sitting patiently by the medic's side. Naruto, was he captured? Yamato asked, and Shizen smiled and shook her head. No, Naruto wasn't captured when we last saw him. Anko-san made sure of it. I wouldn't say the same about you though. Yamato was a bit embarrassed about that and looked down in a moment of shame, laughing awkwardly as he did so. Did we win? Shizen shook her head once more. No, the war was a complete stalemate. The hard push to Graveyard's Mountain almost caused our commanding officers to be in disarray, particularly Tsunade-sama. She was shaken up when Yakushi Kabuto summoned my deceased uncle. Yamato scowled at this. How is Hokage-sama doing? She's doing fine but the shock caused her to be restrained temporarily from the battlefield due to psychological stress. Many things happened while you were accosted, but the final push to Graveyard's Mountain was what obliterated a huge chunk of the dwindling army. It's a miracle that Naruto's peers have managed to survive this long, Shizen mentioned and finished her diagnosis. The medic turned her head towards Chuji, who was visibly the most physically able boy to do what she had in mind. Chuji Kuen, please help Yamato Taishu up until we can get to the nearest town. Once there, I want Saikuin and Shinokuin to gather some information on our location so that we can get back to the main force. Nijikuin, please help us locate the nearest route to a village that would accommodate us, Shizen said, taking command. Yamato protested at first, saying he was all right, but Tsunade's apprentice scowled at him. No, you're currently suffering from muscle atrophy. It's been months since you moved. You're lucky that you managed to survive for this long, Yamato-san. Yamato had a small bead of sweat appearing at the back of his head and accepted the orders given to Chuji. Good grief. I missed out on a whole lot of events. I wish Sakura and the others are faring well. Yamato mentioned this while Chuji carried the man. We're just going to have to trust them to make it out of this. I just wish none of them would end up with either Madara or Uchiha Sasuke, especially Naruto. Niji said this while his Bihakugan was activated. Sai and Shino nodded at this as they began their trek. Sai spoke out the worst-case scenario, but given the circumstances, the probability of Naruto ending up with either of those two is high enough as it is. We all ended up separated and jumbled with circumstances unknown. If anything else, this puts both the Alliance and Akatsuki in a precarious position. Can you tell me what happened as to why we got here? Yamato asked this while being carried by the Akimichi. Shizen then began explaining the final push on Mountain's graveyard and the eventual vortex that occurred soon after when Naruto and Sasuke began their bout. Needless to say, Yamato had a lot to take in with that. The seemingly citywide vortex that swallowed them like a vacuum would certainly be unheard of. Such a wide-scale time and space jutsu would certainly have required the chakra levels of the tailed beasts. We don't know what caused the transfer yet, but rest assured that it wasn't Madara's doing. The ghetto Mazo was pulled from the ground when the vortex began sucking everything like a whirlpool. Then that would explain how I managed to get out of that statue's root. Yamato said this and was surprised by the fact that the reason why he was even alive was through an unknown incident. It was then that he, like the rest of the group, thought about one question that lingered in their heads. What could have done this? In another place. Shikamaru sighed and couldn't believe his luck. Just when he thought that everything couldn't have gone more troublesome, this situation bit him back hard. I really need to keep my thoughts out of recognizing foreshadows. It really just sinks me deeper and deeper into anything I wouldn't want to get involved in. Shikamaru mentioned this as Kiba scoffed at his remark. Would you like some cheese with that wine? Shikamaru only groaned at this and turned to his back and saw Sakura, Hinata, Ino, and Tintin in his group. Being with a girl was tough, but being with multiple girls was hell. Shikamaru, do you have any idea to where we are exactly? You're the 4th Division General's right-hand man. You should have a map in your equipment. Ino said rather impatiently. All of them were getting impatient, 
rather, it wasn't the fact they were lost, but the fact that any of their teammates would have ended up with Sasuke and Madara. They were witnesses to the battle. They saw just what happened before Madara let out that powerful repulsion wave. For the last time, you know, I'm trying to find out where we are. I've been checking the map every hour on the hour. There isn't something that would tell us where we are right now. We'll get there when we get there. Shikamaru said in frustration as Kiba was snickering at his side. Shikamaru-san, might I suggest that we split up then? Therefore we could cover more ground? Lee suggested and Shikamaru shook his head. I can't take that risk. Right now, Sasuke or Madara might be close. That's why we need to move fast. Once we get into a village, preferably a town with a sizable military or something of the like, we can use it as a hiding place until we have an idea of where we are and how we are going to get in contact with the others. If any of us breaks from the group, then the probability of being killed by either one of them would significantly increase. At least with a group, we can have a slightly higher percentage of winning or even taking Sasuke down. You should all understand the situation we're in here. Shikamaru explained as they finally decided to take a rest, no doubt weary from what happened earlier. So what's going to happen to us then? Tintin asked. She had been the calmest member of this little group for a while, most likely because her division was the one that suffered the most number of casualties so far. That included Chuji's father, but Chuji only cried after their encounters when he heard the news. Shikamaru could do nothing but stay by his best friend's side that day. Tintin was the luckiest member to be alive that day. Shikamaru stated it rather honestly as to what to expect. I can't say for sure. We lucked out when many of our strongest peers aren't with us, Naruto and Niji are in who knows where, the same can be said of Sai and Shino. But no matter what it takes, we'll make it through this alive. But we should all be patient and trust me while we move. Hinata and Kiba should be good for lookouts if Madara and Sasuke are close. The closer we are to town, the better. Sakura then suggested to the group, that being the case, if we are going to the nearest town, then it's best to gather enough information if any of the villagers saw any of our friends or teachers. If the worst case scenario were to occur such as Madara or Sasuke, then we're required to evacuate and head in the opposite direction for now. Is that what you're saying? Shikamaru nodded. That's right. We can't possibly take them on with this much fighting force. We'd be killed. This is a reminder especially to you, Sakura. I know you feel that. Sasuke is your responsibility, but don't be an idiot. Your reckless act put everyone, including yourself, in danger. If Naruto hadn't come in time, you wouldn't be standing here. Sakura suddenly looked gloomy as Ino and Hinata comforted her. I'm sorry. You didn't have to rub it in, she said while looking down as if her puppy was kicked. Ino looked back at Shikamaru and shouted at the pineapple head, Shikamaru, you didn't have to be so blunt about it. Kiba chuckled for a moment as Shikamaru looked exasperated while saying, Please don't tell me it's going to be like this for the whole trip. Kiba wanted to add something rather snide as a remark when a sudden invasion of a familiar scent drew him in. His eyes suddenly twitched as Akamaru barked in confirmation. Shikamaru scowled and asked the Inazuka, What is it? I smell blood, and it's coming from three o'clock. Hinata, I'm already on it, the Hyuga girl mentioned as she activated her Dejitsu once more and zoomed in to where Kiba pointed out. I see two people. One is down while the other is standing up, and something is approaching them. I can't fairly describe it since I've never seen a creature like it from anywhere. Yash, then we must save these people and show this creature our springtime of youth. Tintin shook her head and scolded her teammate. Lee, don't be hasty. If you remember what Shikamaru said, we're on the run as well. We can't just be sidetracked like this. Shikamaru, however, had a different idea. No, this couldn't have come at a better time. If those two are from the local folk, then we won't have to search for a town anymore. Lee and Kiba, you two are the fastest members in our group. You two intercept that thing before it comes into contact with the civilians. Tintin and Hinata will provide long-range support and surprise attacks while you two face it head-on. Don't forget Akamaru. Kiba interjected and Shikamaru rolled his eyes. Of course, we can't forget about Akamaru. Ino and Sakura, you two should take those people to safety while I try to pin it down. Let's move out. With that, all of them nodded and jumped to the treetops. With Anko. Anko, being Orochimaru's former apprentice, had a knack for taking in information of the most minor detail. When she finally made it to the nearest town, she was careful not to be noticed by anyone and decided to do a simple hinge of a plain-looking woman when she was inside. Anko made sure that she remained hidden in plain sight as she went inside the town. As she looked around, she noticed several different things that she had never seen before. First was the attire of many of the civilians, 
While many of the attires that were far too different from what she had seen during her trips, they were wearing shirts, pants, and footwear that weren't present in any other nation she had seen so far. The structures were far different, too symmetrical and too small scale for a bustling town such as this. The designs on the buildings weren't something she had seen during her travels outside fire country, especially the creatures that were sculpted at the center of the town. A winged man? Woman? She couldn't tell by the robe that the human wore. It was too big and too loose. The statue carried with it a jug and had been turned over with its shoulder as water cascaded down its mouth. After seeing it for a few seconds, she yet again resumed her reconnaissance and went to the most common area where gossip and old wives' tales abound, the market. When she did get there, she scowled as she noticed one glaring problem that she could have noticed earlier. The signs placed over a fresh batch of produce, they had almost the same characters as some of the signboards that were placed in other parts of the town. She had disregarded those signs earlier as she noticed they were metallic and many had rusts, so she simply assumed that the writing was ineligible. But that would be impossible. The writing system doesn't exist anywhere within the elemental countries. But perhaps the biggest shock to her was when she asked a question to one of the villagers. Excuse me. I'm new to this town and I've been lost for some time. May I inquire as to what the name of this town is and what country are we in? One of the women, seemingly middle-aged, looked at the other before saying, My dear, this is Clover Town in the Kingdom of Fiori. From where exactly did you come from that you had to question what country we're in? Anko scratched the back of her head at this and looked rather sheepish. I'm a traveler you see. I like to go places and see a lot of new things. I don't exactly have a permanent place to stay. The women seemed to look convinced at this and then asked further, Well, where were you born then, dear? From a relatively big village named Kanoha. I don't suppose you know of that place, right? The women shook their heads at this. I'm sorry, dear, but we don't know this Kanoha village that you're talking about, maybe perhaps in the far eastern regions of the continent, but not here. Anko now had to take a deep breath and calm down. There was no way Kanoha isn't an unknown village. It was a village part of the Alliance, one of the major villages that kept the stability of power within the elemental countries. To not know of the leaf, or at least fire country is preposterous. I see. Thank you for your time then, ladies. You've been very much helpful. Anko bowed for a moment and turned her back from the two women who mumbled to each other. What a nice young woman. From what I can gather, bowing with gratitude is a gesture that came from the Far East. Yes, I most certainly remember it being that way. But I must ask why would a woman like her be traveling alone? She must know something about magic then. Why else would someone from so far away be able to survive the creatures that exist outside these walls? But she barely looks the type, if I do say so. She looks much like a common housewife. That indeed. Anko turned to a corner and dispelled her jutsu quickly as she jumped up to the rooftops and made a beeline back into the forest while barely being visible. The signs of the stuff that brought alarm bells ringing in her head were swirling in a mass of paranoia that she wanted Kakashi to know immediately, even if he might just consider her insane. These things that she saw with her very own eyes, the statues, the architecture, the designs, the writing system, and the damn town itself. All of it kept telling her that they weren't in the elemental countries anymore. She dashed to the forest at blinding speeds. This urgent news was what mattered right now. If by any chance her conclusion to this was real, she would utterly freak out. Even if it was so far-fetched and so out of the box, even with the evidence and signs presented to her, her mind would simply not allow the idea to creep through her thoughts and accept it for what it was. She didn't like it. She utterly denied it saying such a thing would be impossible, that there was simply no way for it to happen. In another place, fear was an emotion easy to grasp, easy to understand, and chaotic enough to bring out all sorts of different emotions. Anger, hate, mortification, apprehensiveness, despair, and even fear itself manifests into a jumble of emotions that explode like dynamite. Mira Jane stared up at her brother, driven out of control by attempting to take over a powerful monster soul. In between them stood Lee Santa, her younger sister, the youngest of all three siblings, standing between her and their beloved brother, whose form was being taken over by the king of beasts. Brother, it's me, Lisanna. Please, try to remember. She shouted as the scarlet beast approached. Its purple eyes seemingly shone a little, and smoke billowed out of its mouth as the dark clouds now gave in to rain once more. Please, brother, seeing you like this is hurting us. Please try to regain control. The beast, however, would have none of it. It growled as it walked towards them, saliva dripping out of its mouth, looking famished as it gazed at the two humans. Without as much as a word, it gave a loud and deafening roar and went after them, 
without any hesitation at all. Dynamic entry. A green streak passed by the two girls, looking as much like a comet as it smashed onto the face of the King of Beasts, sending it flying and crashing to the ground at a good twenty feet. By now, the person's features came to view as a boy wearing a green jumpsuit, along with a similarly colored green vest and a pair of orange leg warmers on the boy's lower thighs. His hands were wrapped around very long straps of bandages reaching just below his elbows, a bowl haircut, a pair of big doe eyes, and the thickest pair of eyebrows anyone has ever seen. Foul beast that harms unarmed civilians. Prepare yourself with my burning passion and youth. Lee Santa and Mira looked stunned for a moment before they looked at each other. The boy certainly had a very peculiar way of talking, matching his appearance to boot. But this was something the boy shouldn't have messed around with. He shouldn't have jumped into the situation. What are you doing? Lee Santa exclaimed as she walked up to the green-clad Chunin, who looked rather dumbfounded by her reaction. Wasn't it obvious that he just saved her? That beast is my brother. He's gone berserk because of the takeover magic. Please don't do any unnecessary harm to him because of this. Lee Santa shouted but it was significantly ignored when Elfman rose from his position and charged at them once more. Lee was once more prepared to take a stance when a person with wild chestnut brown hair, tattoo markings on both his cheeks wearing a black long sleeve underneath a green flak jacket and equally dark pants, to his side was a dog, a very big one at that. As swift as the boy with the facial tattoos popped up from the bushes and ran wildly around the beast, slashing and tearing through the man's seemingly near impervious hide. What the hell is up with that dude's skin? Damn thing is as tough as steel. Kiba shouted indefinitely as both he and Akamaru jumped at the side of Lee while the monster remained agitated. The monster was about to charge again until it sensed danger coming from the treetops and a flurry of knives flew down from the heavens and descended upon him. Acting on instinct, the monster backpedaled and tried to avoid any and all sharp projectiles that planted themselves to the ground. Until another person, this time a girl with long flowing blue hair, pale skin as white as snow and equally pale lavender eyes wearing a dark long-sleeved shirt with a red spiral design by the shoulder and equally black pants and a green flak jacket, appeared from behind with palms wide open and pushing it directly at the monster's back. Jukin, gentle fist. With two strikes, the girl and the monster were now at opposite directions until it collapsed. You girls all right? A boy whose hair was held back to a ponytail looking like a pineapple mentioned as he stepped just behind Kiba, and Lee asked the two girls who were on the ground looking quite shocked. Please, stop whatever you're doing to my brother. He isn't himself. He lost control of his magic when he attempted to take an S-class monster. Lee Santa pleaded to the group, and Shikamaru stopped in his train of thought at this. S-class? A brother losing control over his ability? Crap, this is going to be difficult. Shikamaru complained and scratched the back of his head for this. Upon hearing the aforementioned word, Hinata quickly jumped away from the scene and went over to their side. I'm sorry to say this, folks. Looks like we aren't exterminating monsters anytime soon. So instead of elimination, we're going to subdue that thing until this guy's jutsu ends. Shikamaru stated as the rest all had a frown on their faces. It was obvious that this would be far more difficult than it was originally planned. I'm revising my strategy now. Since Kageinui, Shadow Needles, wouldn't work well with that guy in restraining, We've got no choice but to nick it down with non-lethal force until Eno manages to probe that thing's mind. Kiba voiced his opinion on the matter. Are you nuts? If that thing's an S-class, then consider yourself dead. It's hard enough to put that thing down. Now you want us to restrain it? I knew there was something wrong about this. What will you have me do then? Tenten then appeared at Shikamaru's side as the brunette gave the necessary instructions. Keep that thing away and corner it enough to let Eno use her jutsu. I'll provide mid-range support and I'll try to immobilize that thing long enough for Ino to use her jutsu. A girl with pink hair then appeared to their side, wearing the same outfit as that of the pineapple-headed Chunin that was giving out commands. Then I'll be Lee San's backup. I'll do most of the distractions while Lee San blitzes, Sakura said as she wore her black gloves and palmed her right fist. Hinata, can you tell me how much chakra that thing has? Shikamaru asked. He needed an estimate as to how long his shadow needles could hold and Ino was already gathering chakra for her jutsu. The girl with the white eyes nodded and looked at the monster intently as she said to the pineapple head. The chakra buildup indicates that it's down in level. From what I can see, the chakra is acting like fuel to maintain the transformation. You can probably bind that thing for a few seconds before Ino san's jutsu takes effect. Shikamaru of cursed. This is going to be such a drag. Ino. You better stay put and be sure to time your jutsu well. Remember that we're trying to restore his psyche back. 
Whatever that guy's ability is, it's interfering with his mental processes. You're the best bet to end this. Shikamaru mentioned this as he grabbed something from his pouch. Who are you people? Why are you wearing such similar uniforms? Are you? Are you from the council? Lisanna asked, nervous that these people were part of the Magic Council, sent to Fairy Tale for another issued warning. Can't you tell by our headbands? We're part of the Shinobi Alliance. What are you doing here, anyway? It's dangerous to go out of towns when war is happening. Do you want to get killed? Kiba asked, as the monster soon growled and crouched down, studying the group and looking for an opening. What do you mean there's a war? The kingdom of Fiori isn't at war with any nation right now. Lisanna objected, and many of the ninja soon stopped dead in their tracks as it entered their heads. The elemental nations do not use the word kingdom to describe autonomous governance. That would fall into the criteria of a country. Another thing that bothered them was that in all of their studies of history and geography within the elemental countries, there is no country named Fiori settled within the map. It was then that the King of Beasts saw its chance. It instantly moved like a speeding bullet towards them, rampaging like a wild bull. Akamaru had Lee Santa and Mira Jane ride him and put them at a much more comfortable zone where the battle wouldn't affect the two mages. Because from the looks of things, everything was about to get even more devastating. Fiori? Where on the goddamn map is that? Kiba asked with a curse as they jumped up and separated when the monster charged at them. Shikamaru simply shrugged at this as he finally grabbed what he was searching for from his pouch and unleashed a hail of shuriken at the beast that were merely deflected by its skin. Unbelievable. No amount of projectile weapons would work on it. The skin is barely even scratched. Shikamaru then landed on a tree branch while Sakura and Lee faced the monster head on. Sakura-san. I'm counting on your strength to keep him busy. Lee said this and crouched down, unlocking the leg weights placed on his leg and unfurled them. Without Guy around, he would have to decide on his own whether or not he should go all out. Lee realized long ago that Guy Sensei wouldn't be around all the time to tell him what to do. That he was aware and knew sometimes that he just had to disobey Guy's rule for what was truly needed. With a mighty cry, Lee tossed the heavy object straight at the beast who looked dumbfounded as much as anyone who saw their weights as weapons. Nevertheless, its instincts told it to dodge and quickly felt two minor tremors on the ground. It looked back and saw the two leg weights created small craters around it to signify how much weight Lee was carrying before a kick had collided with its cheek, sending it flying to the opposite side. Lee then appeared at the monster's back and gave a powerful spinning kick. Kanoha Senpu, Leaf Whirlwind the monster was forced to turn around by that powerful kick as it staggered from the blow. Regaining its footing, it swung its mighty arm around, forcing Rock Lee to halt his attack and jump back, giving the monster enough time to shatter the ground with its immense strength and stagger Lee back. Seeing the perfect opportunity, it charged at Lee with a deafening roar and blinding speed and like a crimson streak, instantly closed the gap between it and the green-clad Chunin, a fist held back as he was about to strike Lee. If its power were talking about, I'm not going to lose. Sakura shouted as she appeared right next to Lee with a simple body flicker, and her own fist reeled back. When the monster let go of the punch, Sakura did so as well, gathering enough chakra and building it in her right hand as she collided her ukashu, cherry blossom impact, directly at the monster's fist. Smash! The result was a reverberating impact all around them as the local fowls that live in the area flew up at the sudden disturbance. The force sent both Sakura and the beast flying from the epicenter of the event forcing Lee to jump back and land right beside Sakura who gained her footing and created a minor trench when she skidded on the ground. Didn't. Hinata strike that thing's tenketsu points? It should be paralyzed right about now. As if on cue, Hinata had jumped into the fray once more, her hands ready to strike the monster down as it felt a bit disoriented from the attack. It turned around and saw Hinata dashing at him, but sidestepped instead once its eyes were on her. Another hail of knives then bombarded the area around the beast, which dodged while his skin deflected the knives. It tilted its head to the side as it finally noticed that the knives couldn't scratch him. If this was what the amount of damage that these people could do then he had nothing to fear. Don't let go of your breath just yet. Tintin stated as she clasped her hand together for a weird hand gesture and soon enough, the handles from the knives started glowing. Thanks to the mind of the beast, it could not have predicted any sooner that Tintin didn't just throw knives into the field. She threw exploding projectiles. With that brilliant flash of light, the area exploded several times while the impact made the earth tremble slightly as smoke billowed out from the center of the explosion. While the smoke was impeding the monster's vision, Hinatis certainly wasn't. With that necessary cover, 
She instantly closed in on the target and held out her middle and index fingers out and began performing one of her clan's most prized techniques. Hack Roka Jiansho, 8 trigrams, 64 strikes. It was then that Hinata's hand flowed like quick silver, gracefully and dangerously weaving her fingers like an intricate web, driving them to every Tenketsu point that she could see. Her attack while unlike Niji who was faster and drove his fingers like lightning to a pole and struck hard like a sword piercing an armor, Hinata was more graceful, more refined and more controlled but just as dangerous. When Hinata was about to finish her attack with double palm strike, the monster gave an inhuman roar as Hinata began closing every Tenketsu point in its body before she ended it with a double palm strike that forced it out of the smoke. Sakura, don't let it regain its footing. Shikamaru commanded as he began pulling out some ninja wire while he jumped from tree to tree. On it, Sakura said and jumped up and prepared for another Okashu when they noticed that it was decreasing in size. Hinata's attack had considerably reduced the monster's fighting power. Lee Sana and Mira Jane, who had noticed this, became dangerously aware of what was happening. No, stop. You're going to kill him. Mira finally shouted but was ignored. Instead a hand was placed firmly on her shoulder by a blonde-haired girl who said to them, No, don't worry. We know what we're doing. How can you say that? Elfman's magic is running out. Don't continue this further. Lisanna shouted and Eno shook her head. Just watch and don't interrupt. You want your brother back, do you? It was then that the two nodded and Eno gave them a reassuring smile then put your trust in us. With that said Sakura crashed to the ground and created a massive crater that caused multiple fissures all around her as some of the rocks from underground wedged upwards. Elfman staggered, as the pain was too much to handle. The soul of the King of Beasts was slowly starting to lose its grip on him. Although weakening, it was still strong. But that didn't mean that he wasn't now aware of what was happening to his body. Kiba, do it. Shikamaru commanded as he began weaving his hands and formed a seal and the shadow beneath him began to rise up. Ninpo, Kage Nui, Ninja Art, Shadow Needles, Giju Ninpo, Shikyaka no Jutsu, Beast Mimicry Ninja Art, Four Legs Techniques. Kiba and Akamaru then dashed around the battlefield as they surrounded the beast that was already staggering. Both man and beast ran around Elfman in circles as they chipped away at some of the monster's skin. With that done, Akamaru and Kiba scattered away and began cutting some of the ninja wire that Shikamaru had set up. The tension wire snapped and lashed all around as Shikamaru's shadow needles caught it whilst making their way towards Elfman. The possessed man was soon entangled by one of the needles as the wire that came along with it trapped him instantly. With its strength barely being cut down and the tension wires vaguely keeping him in place, Shikamaru's hand struggled in maintaining the shadow sewing and hurriedly shouted to Ino, Ino. Stop this guy right now. I can't hold him off for long. I'm already on it. Ninpo. Shin Hakorin no Jutsu, Ninja Art. Extensive mind reading skill. A second later, Ino's body went limp and she fell to the ground. Lee Sana caught the woman and Elfman struggling suddenly came to a halt. What happened? Mira asked and Lee was the one who answered her question. I cannot say for certain as to what it is that is taking place right now, but know that our friend is helping your brother gain back his reasoning. Shikamaru sighed at this, and his jutsu began to hold. The shadow user turned around to the girls and asked them something that they had trouble understanding from what the short-haired girl said. Care to repeat on where exactly we are, miss? Lee Sana nodded in an absent-minded fashion as she began telling them about Fiori. The history, the people and the guilds that make up most of these mages that use the power of magic. Hey, Shikamaru, I normally don't curse this out loud, but can you allow me just this once? Kiba asked and Shikamaru waved him off. I'm not your mother, Kiba. Okay. With that, Kiba screamed from the top his lungs and cursed like a sailor. Son of a bitch. This is the most messed up situation we've had since the whole war. How in the hell did we end up in this crappy situation? Wow, look at him go. He's worse than Mirane when she has her period. Lee Sana mentioned as Mira Jane was beat red at that and protested to her younger sister. I do not act like that and I don't swear like a sailor. I see what you mean, Sakura said with a strained smile on her face while the others chuckled. So what now? Lee Sana asked, looking at the others. Tintin was the one to answer. Now, we wait. We wait until Eno sorts out any jumbled mental processes your brother is suffering from. Who exactly are you people? Mira Jane asked, noticing how experienced these fighters were. They all had impeccable timing in their attacks quickly covering any openings and exploiting opportunities to the point that it allowed for multiple ones. She had never seen people like them. They were good, 
too good for any freelancing mage. It was as if they were professionals, or, to be more precise, veterans. People who aren't from around here. We came to this place because of some freak accident that sent some of us in different directions. We're currently looking for them while avoiding a certain person, Shikamaru explained as Mira Jane asked. Okay, so if you were sent here by accident, what was Dog Boy over there talking about when he was screaming his soul out into the wild? Hey, Kiba interjected. Shikamaru sighed at this and glared at Kiba, who simply took a step back and sighed. It looked like he would be fabricating more lies ahead. Sighing, the general of the 4th Division merely looked out at the setting sun while its orange glow slowly disappeared. Ashibana Town A man staggered through the back alleys that night, intending to return to the place where his guild was located on the outskirts of town. Being a member of a dark guild usually didn't involve many job offerings, mostly because the jobs were screened by the Magic Council and Era. Many of the unofficial missions posted on their wall may be high-paying, but those missions took a lot of guts and skill to accomplish. He was surprised that many dark guilds still existed despite the Magic Council's influence and the numerous high-paying jobs offered to them. Perhaps this was the work of the Balam Alliance. He didn't know. But the fact that he could still put food on his table, even if he was associated with a dark guild, was enough. Rounding a corner, he was suddenly stopped when someone grabbed his shoulder. He turned around and felt a powerful shove that sent him into the wall, pinning him while a sharp, stinging pain forced him to yelp and look at his right shoulder. The man quickly sobered up as he saw the sword impaling him through his shoulder and a pair of red eyes with three commas swirling about the iris, staring at him with nothing but apathy. You will tell me just where I am right now, the boy spoke, suggesting these words while the three tomo in his eyes kept spinning, putting the drunken man in a trance with his hypnotic magic. As the person spoke and as Uchiha Sasuke obtained the necessary information he needed, he pulled Kuzanagi out of the man's shoulder and looked down. I was spared. Who said anything about sparing you? Sasuke mentioned and, in one fluid motion, swung his Kuzanagi sideways. The man stood for a moment in shock as Sasuke swung his sword to rid it of the blood before sheathing it back into its metallic scabbard. A line soon appeared by the man's neck, stretching to the other end until finally, his head fell off and a sudden geyser of blood erupted from the neck and sprayed upwards before the head fell to the ground and tumbled, along with his body. Sasuke left with nothing but an apathetic look on his face, leaving town and quickly making his way towards this guild that this man was building. He needed to gather information, and this would be the best place for him to see the ins and outs of this new world and how he should get back. He also needed to see if a certain blonde made his way here as well. Killing that person would mean that the only wall standing between him and Kanoha would be destroyed. He had sworn to kill Uzumaki Naruto, and he would follow through even if it cost him his life. Woodlands. Niji had been pondering for a while about what happened to them. He was beginning to suspect that everything was certainly not as they should be expecting. A lot of things threw him off while they were walking. He didn't exactly know what he was feeling, but damn his intuition for telling him that something was off in this situation of theirs. Shizen hadn't been able to read the map yet, probably because they weren't in a town where they could determine just where they were. The whole thing was starting to annoy him. How much more would the answer elude him? His thoughts, however, were suddenly interrupted when he saw several small houses just beyond the hill. Niji put aside his worrying and told his makeshift team about it. I see a relatively small village just north of here, Niji announced, and Shizen sighed with relief before saying to the Hyuga, Thank goodness, we can let our guard down for a moment while we're in it. Niji Kuin, please lead the way. Shino, who had been silent throughout the whole trip, kept looking around the scenery with a frown while Sai quietly followed the current team leader, Shizun. The insects have been restless since we got here, Shino suddenly mentioned as they continued to walk. Sai instantly picked up on what Shino mumbled, but couldn't exactly decipher what Shino really meant. Is something the matter, Shino-san? asked the former root member, to which Shino answered. My insects have been restless since we arrived here. I could not come to a proper conclusion about their behavior yet, as I cannot be certain as to what they might have a problem with. But it is clear that it's making me uncertain as well. Niji who had overheard the conversation, found it the least bit comforting that even Shino had a feeling that something was terribly off about the whole thing. The quiet forest and the wind rustling against the tree branches didn't seem to placate the anxiety and nervousness that all of them were experiencing right now. Uncertainty can have a lot of effects on the mental psyche, if I must say, Shizen helpfully reminded them and then continued, all of us right now have this feeling of isolation in this place. Every one of us feels it when we're here but this is the first time that I felt such an emotion in a heavily dense forest. Normally it would simply be in the towns, not here. 
but this is actually the first time that I've felt like this. Niji silently took note of this. So everyone was feeling that something was terribly off about the whole situation. Now it wasn't just mere paranoia on his part. Niji took comfort in the fact that at least all of them had been feeling disjointed in this place. Once they reached the outskirts of the small village, they happened to stumble upon a man who looked well-built, wearing something close to primitive tribesmen's attire and carrying a bundle of hay over his shoulders. Shizen stepped in front and asked him, Excuse me, sir, but we would like to know where the nearest inn is, please? We've been scouring the land for many hours now, and one of us is currently injured. The man, however, was shaking like a leaf as he looked at them, dropping the item he was carrying as he asked, Why are you all in the same uniforms? Are you from Era's Magic Council? Magic? That wouldn't certainly be the case, but... Era, where on earth is that located? Shizen thought, as bewilderment took stage on her face, to which Niji answered for her, No, we're not from this Era Magic Council. If you hadn't noticed from the emblem we wear, we're members of the Joint Military of the Alliance, and we would... Alliance. You're part of the Alliance. The man suddenly backed away instantly as he looked like his soul just got ripped off from his body. He was deathly white. Niji Kuen, please stand down. I'll be the one to do the talking for us. It feels like you're intimidating him, Shizen mentioned as she gave a strained smile. Sai helpfully added with a smile of his own. With Niji-san's eyes and default expression, anyone would be scared. Chuji and Yamato looked at their pale-skinned teammate, then back to Niji, who simply scoffed off at the unintended insult. Well, aside from that, back to the matter at hand, sir. We would like to know just where. Stay back, evildoers. As a member of Kate Shelter, I will defend this village with my life. Dogs of the Balam Alliance, prepare yourselves. Hold on, mister. Don't be hasty. Chuji mentioned, as many of them were left utterly confused. They were about to approach the man calmly when they saw several villagers approaching them in alarm. Shizen sighed in defeat. It seemed like this little misunderstanding would escalate to something much, much worse. Perhaps it would be prudent to incapacitate them at this situation? Shino asked, and Shizen groaned, No, Shino Kuen, we won't be doing any unnecessary violence here. Try to reason out as best as you can. It would be a very long, long day for all of them right now. Shikamaru's team. Let me get this straight. Mira Jane began talking as she sat in front of the ninjas while waiting for Ino to finish her jutsu. You're telling me that you? Mira pointed to Shikamaru and then continued. Are members of a joint paramilitary force of six powerful nations that hail from the Far East, locked in a war against an organization that's bent on world domination through a living statue and has their own private army of clones and undead zombies? Shikamaru forgot to mention the alternate dimension, part of his explanation, but he didn't want to be labeled as a complete nut. That in the story was already pretty hard to believe. Shikamaru could only give a sigh and nod. It sounds terribly unbelievable, Mira Jane commented as she shook her head. But since you saved our lives, I'm willing to believe you for now. Another pause and she scowled at them. Unless you're from a dark guild. If it weren't for the fact that he was holding the King of Beasts in place while Eno did her jutsu, he would have shivered. Damn these overbearing women. Speaking of overbearing, his teammate Kiba was looking quite distracted as they were waiting for Eno. The Inazuka was looking at Myra's general direction and had a blank look on his face until he noticed a small trickle of blood falling down his nose. Shikamaru sighed at this and looked up. Great, now it's just a matter of time when Sakura takes notice. Kiba, you damn pervert, you're just as bad as Naruto. I'm going to kill you. Sakura suddenly stood up and Kiba, who had just as easily heard Sakura's shriek, snapped out of his funk and instantly backed away from Sakura who was by now being restrained by Lee and Tintin. Wow, you guys can be a rowdy bunch as well. I think you'll fit into our guild quite nicely at that, Lee Sana commented as she was talking to the shy Huga girl asking them about some of their exploits before coming into this place. Hinata could only give small details of what they did and what it was that they had been trying to fight for. To this, the Huga girl was reminded of the blonde, and her cheeks slowly gave off a crimson hue. The fact that Sakura spoke his name just made it worse. Receive your punishment like a man. Sakura-san, please calm down. Beating up Kiba would do us no good. Shikamaru only shook his head once more and looked back at the slumped form of the King of Beasts. He scowled momentarily and hoped Eno would be back soon. Sitting like this was getting tiring, and he could swear that Mira was glaring daggers at him. Inside Elfman's mind, Eno surveyed the wooden corridor in complete silence. The wooden doors emitted a solemn but eerie silence, with small but noticeable fissures appearing on the walls. 
Such tranquility contradicted the turmoil outside. As she began opening doors left and right, she probed Elfman's mind to find where his consciousness actually lay. When she reached the fifth door on the left, she observed the man whose body was being consumed by the beast's appearance outside. His right half was entirely taken over. Eno analyzed silently as she watched the man thrash about and double over in pain. Many outside the clan didn't know this, but the Yamanaka understood that this was a clear metaphor of how the mind works. From the looks of things, the monster's half of the personality that composed Elfman in this room was the ID, representing primary desires. Food, safety, sex, all part of this force's functions. It was easy to see that the monster's version of taking over was typical of the likes of Orochimaru's cursed seal. It could take over consciously or subconsciously, depending on the emotions and brain patterns suggested by the user. Although the pattern was easy enough to decipher, the problem was, since this was the ID, where the most basic instincts for self-preservation and pleasure-seeking are located, it meant the subconscious and even the conscious person itself could be taken over in an instant. The spread could be rapid if not noticed immediately. What are you doing here? Elfman asked, finally noticing the blonde girl who was looking at him with a frown. I'm a mind walker. I specialize in techniques concerning the psyche. Get away. This monster is driving me insane. He's going to kill you. Elfman warned as the monster instantly took over and charged at her, its mouth showcasing sharp, jagged teeth. Eno, however, remained unfazed as the monster charged at her. Just as the King of Beasts charged at her head-on, it felt a sudden force block it and send it crashing back to the other side of the room. How? Elfman asked, holding his head while the monster side of him wailed. I'm a mind walker, remember? In this place, I can do anything, especially when I've breached your mental defenses. From here on, I can do anything I want, from reconfiguring your mind to become a mindless servant to leaving you brain dead. A small configuration is all it takes for me to tear this mind down, Eno mentioned as she approached Elfman, who was visibly struggling. Then please, put a stop to this thing. He pleaded, and Eno simply raised her hand and flicked the monster's forehead, separating it from Elfman. When she did so, she noticed a small chain extending and elongating from Elfman as the monster lay flat on the ground with its leg tied to the chain as well. It landed unceremoniously on the ground with an undignified tug as the chains rattled. Not good, Eno commented, and Elfman asked why. Eno simply grabbed the chains and explained. You see this chain here? This is a representation of a part of your personality, or to be more precise, your ID. My what? Elfman asked, obviously confused. Your personality is divided into three parts. The ID, the sense of instinct that governs basic needs, your ego, the one who decides what is a realistically sound judgment, and your superego, the one that governs all forms of moral discernment. Right now, this monster contains your ID, your desires and reactions to all your basic needs like food and water. It seems that the monster has assimilated into your personality for far too long to be comfortable. This is only a temporary solution to your problem. From now on, you will have to struggle against it and suppress it on your own. I can't do much else because if I erase that thing out of your mind, you'll be affected as well, and you have a high possibility of becoming insane or worse, ending up shutting off all your organs and winding up dead. I don't know how to suppress these things because I've never experienced them, but there is one person who could possibly help you in that particular field. Elfman's eyes widened, and he looked at Eno with succeeding interest. Who might that be? Please tell me. I need to learn how to control this. I don't know if he could help because the way something was incorporated into him was a different method from yours. But he knows what's currently going on with you. The problem is, he's not within our group at the moment, and we're currently searching for him. With that, Eno clasped her hands together, and the technique ended. Back outside, Eno groaned as she got up, feeling her back ache a little as she looked over to the slumped form of the King of the Beasts, which was slowly receding back to its human form. Elfman Nichan, Lisanna shouted as did Mira Jane, as they dashed over to their brother. I take it was a success? Shikamaru asked as Eno cradled her head a little. Partially. The encroachment from the monster was too far gone to fully disconnect it from the victim. Sakura took this opportunity to inspect Elfman's injuries. What does that entail? Shikamaru asked. Normally, he wouldn't push for detailed answers, but being the Kazakage's right-hand man in the army and, by consequence, a field strategist, Shikamaru grew to understand the importance of having all the answers he needed. It's what made his division survive the longest throughout the entire war. It means that the monster is now a part of him, as he is a part of it, just like Naruto and the Kyubi's predicament, 
Ino explained as she got up and Shikamaru stretched his legs, which grew tired from crouching. That doesn't sound so good. It was the only way to stop him without killing him, remember? Ino responded, and Shikamaru wordlessly stood up. Sakura, who had been assessing Elfman to see if there were any more problems, addressed the shinobi group with a frown. It looks like we'll be here for a while. Elfman San has suffered several fractures around his arm from where I punched him, and he's currently suffering from mild to moderate exhaustion. If we decide to go to the closest town tonight, it would be very bad for his health. Kiba snorted a laugh at that. Geez, Sakura, you sure don't know how to hold back. If that guy was normal, he would most likely be dead by now. Mira Jane, Lee Sana, and especially Sakura didn't find it amusing at all. Oh, that's it. Get back here, Kiba. After I'm done with you, you'll wish I neutered you instead. Sakura threatened as she rolled up her sleeves and was about to go after the Inazuka. Kiba, Shikamaru, and Lee flinched, and even Akamaru stayed down on the ground, keeping his head low. I have a better idea. Why don't we let Akamaru carry Elfman instead? That way, we can get to the nearest town as soon as possible. I've been meaning to get to an inn and have a relaxing bath. It's high time we got some rest, Tintin suggested, and Hinata asked Lee Sana. Hmm. Is there a town nearby with a sizable inn? We would like to take a rest, please. We've been doing a lot of work lately, and though we may not look like it, we're very tired. You're in luck. Hausanka Town is just a few hours from here. We can rest there for a day before we go back to Magnolia Town, Lee Sana said with an ear-splitting grin as the others seemed relieved. Since you saved my brother, I'm going to repay you by paying for the inn's stay. But don't let it fool you that we're all buddy buddies, you hear me? If I find out you're all from a dark guild, consider your asses toast, Mira Jane threatened, while Kiba whispered to Shikamaru. I don't know about our asses, but I sure would like to touch hers. Shikamaru groaned and palmed his face at this. Why was he always the one ending up in the most troublesome situations? Clover Town. Come again, Anko? I didn't catch the parts after you said, we were transported into another world, Kakashi mentioned, and the snake mistress and their makeshift team held her head in annoyance inside. Not that she was annoyed at Kakashi, but the fact that the silver-haired Jounin couldn't find it believable even with the presented facts she had for him. I know it's terribly implausible, but what can you expect? That somehow we were sent to some uncharted part of the elemental countries, even though this place is as huge as the hot spring country? The writing system here doesn't exist anywhere from what I've seen. Enko did have a point. From what she had shown him, the writing system that was presented to him didn't really exist anywhere in the elemental countries. He was sure of it. That would be a problem then, Kakashi mentioned and looked over at Guy, who was carrying his unconscious student. With our currency like this, we wouldn't possibly be able to use it to stay for the night. So all of us right now are officially broke, Kakashi continued as he looked upwards. So what are our options right now? Enko asked, and Kakashi began to think. Guy seemed to have a suggestion though. We set up camp as we originally planned. We have no other choice. We can't bend the rules to what we like when we don't even know what rules apply here in the first place. I think it's a fair idea that we should remain low profile and circulate from time to time to get some freelance work. Silence reigned between the three adults. That's actually a good idea, Guy. We could use some odd jobs right now if we want to survive in this place, and what better way to do that than be like mercenaries? Anko nodded, but Kakashi shook his head. No, not like mercenaries, but AS mercenaries. But first, we need a lot more background knowledge concerning this place. We don't want to be fugitives in an unknown country if we can help it. Madara and Sasuke are likely after Naruto, and the more allies we have, the better. We can worry about our other teammates later. For now, we should rest for the day and recover our strength tomorrow. I know we're all tired one way or another. Shouldn't the brat get some medical attention? Enko asked, and although she knew much of Naruto's regeneration trait, Naruto had, on a few occasions, been hospitalized to some degree. That's what I'm worried about, but we don't have any money to place him in a good facility to recuperate, so it's best we let the regeneration kick in. Other than that, I suggest we do rounds here until Naruto reawakens. The ones that will go to the city will gather information and get any leads to any jobs willing to pay at a reasonable price or any detail about our comrades. Any of you disagree to that? Kakashi asked, and both Jounins shook their heads. Outskirts of Ashibana Town. Blade Wing has always been a pretty obscure dark guild. Not much was known about it, for it was a mediocre guild at best. The jobs that were delegated to them happened to come from politicians who do under-the-table deals in their vicinity. They remained quite obscure and unknown for several years since its establishment. 
Being a member of the Balam Alliance didn't exactly mean that you had a lot of reputation like the three main dark guilds, especially Grimoire Heart. Even the guildmaster was an obscure figure, not out of mystery and intrigue, however, but simply because no one cared. But he was surprised when he suddenly saw most of his members down on the ground, lying in pools of their own blood, while a main heap of unconscious members lay just about at the front door, with one boy of spiky jet black hair greeting him with the tip of his sword pointing at him all the while sitting on top of the bodies. You, are you the leader of this sorry group of thugs? Sasuke asked, and the guild master gritted his teeth. Who the hell are you? And what makes you so smug that you can take out my men? No one important. I would just like to get some information concerning a target I'm currently after, the boy mentioned as his eyes morphed into a pair of bloodshot irises, with three commas circulating each other in a counterclockwise fashion. Are you from the council? The guild master asked, his tone indicating unbridled fear as it shook like a withering leaf. Council? You must be mistaken. I don't work for anyone. I do things alone. I'm just one person seeking revenge for the people that wronged me, the boy mentioned. But the man simply didn't care. What did my guild ever do to you? You look like some nobody, says the unknown guild master who has no power over an organization he's a member of. Sasuke then stood up from the pile of bodies he sat on and planted the sword on the ground. Bastard, you'll pay for what you did. The man then began chanting his spell as Sasuke literally blurred from his vision and instantly appeared from the back, his hand crackling with electricity. You're lucky that I don't use my Chidori on a person who can give me the information that I need with a fatal blow. Be thankful I spared your life. Blood then suddenly sprayed as the guild master's right arm flew away from his shoulder. Only the bloody stump was the reminder of where it was connected. The man howled in pain as he was instantly on his knees and started weeping. Pathetic. This is a guild master? I had better expectations than this. Sasuke gripped the man by the back of his head and held him to his eye level. His Sharingan spinning wildly as he stared at the man, putting him in a hypnotic trance. Sasuke smirked and sneered inwardly, You will tell me what I need to know. And then, the guild master's world went black. Woodlands. That is so sad. Every member that was currently surrounding them was weeping for some unfathomable reason. Shizen explained that they were soldiers of an alliance of countries, not guilds. It would explain their almost uniform attire, and how most of the members of this particular guild, as she was lectured about, were taken aback at the situation they explained. They knew that they were marooned for some reason, but they never knew just how marooned they were. She took her map and gave the sizable piece of paper to the leader of the guild now named Kate Shelter. Robal gladly accepted the map from Shizun and unfurled it for many of them to see. A few minutes of analysis came from the old man as he looked at it curiously. This location of the collective countries here doesn't exist anywhere in Earthland. The man shouted, and Yamato was the one to verbalize his surprise. But that's impossible. That's a whole continent you're talking about. Well, believe me, boy. This continent doesn't exist anywhere in this world. There isn't a fire country existing here for miles and miles in the east. If it were true, it would have reached Fiori by now. This country is almost twice the size of Fiori, close to an empire. To this, Robal asked them seriously, just how did you get here then? If this place truly existed? Niji looked at their commanding officer, and then to the rest of his teammates. Shino was silent throughout the whole ordeal, his hands visibly placed in his pockets, while Chuji didn't feel like eating anything. Sai was watching over the town for reconnaissance to check if any of their enemies were nearby, so he didn't know and Yamato clearly did not know how to answer. The man was only conscious after the event occurred, so it was understandable that he couldn't answer very well. So Shizen became their acting commanding officer for this team for now, and thus, their spokesperson. We would answer that question if only any of you believed just how we came here, she started, and everyone not members of the Joint Shinobi Army nodded. And then, Shizen talked. She told all about what they were doing just before that mysterious light from the sky absorbed them. She told them all about their potential enemies and how they could potentially be here, how dangerous they were and how deadly they would be. She told them how they were searching for their friends again and how it was important that they get a hold of the most important factor to their war, the one named Naruto. Should we believe them, Chief Robal? One of the tribesmen asked, and Robal closed his eyes for a moment, as if trying to discern any lies beneath that story. It all seems straight out of a story, lad, but one can never be too sure in a world of lies and truths. The line that we are walking on is very thin. Everyone, I'm home. A voice shouted, and they all turned around, seeing a small girl with a bipedal cat wearing clothing walking towards them with a wave. 
Wendy Marvel looked on in wonder as she saw new faces in front of her. They were all wearing the same clothing, and another person just landed beside her, surprising her with his entrance. Seeing the animated drawing of a bird behind them disperse in a cloud of smoke. My reconnaissance is done, Shizen-san. I believe that there won't be any sightings of Uchiha Sasuke or the man with the mask today. This town is safe for now. Um, mm. who are you, mister? Wendy asked, looking very unsure and somewhat scared. A new person in their guild was not something she was used to. The bipedal cat stood in front of her, and Sai gave that unnerving smile. I go by the name of Sai. What's your name? You look very cute, he said, offering a compliment. Many of the people who watched instantly shivered. He's not into prepubescent girls, is he? One of them asked, and Niji shook his head. Yamato was the one who answered for them. No, Sai is the most socially awkward person in our little group. He was born and raised differently from other children. You could say he's poor in his social skills. Sai quietly patted the girl's head when she told him her name, although she looked reluctant. Sai then added, Wendy, that's a very cute name. Sai, please step away from the girl. Everyone is getting the wrong impression, Chuji suggested, while Sai looked honestly confused. Aren't children the happiest when they feel some sort of acknowledgement? For a stranger, it only scares them, Sai Kuen, Shizen helpfully added. And Sai seemed to acknowledge this and grabbed a small notebook and pen, writing down the notes that Shizen had told him. Robal seemed to laugh at this as he said, For an honest person like him, I guess I can put my faith in you yet, Miss Shizun. Never have I seen a person's soul so bare about the truth that he tells it straightforwardly. No evil person can ever be that honest. You can stay here as long as you like, but you have to inform me what it is that you plan to do next. I'm sure many of us here can lend a hand. With that, Everyone in the guild looked at each other and grinned. The shinobi looked rather curious at this and gazed back at the old chief, the guild master of Kate Shelter. How sank a town. It was nice and relaxing that they had finally found a place to have a good sleep with a warm futon. They'd been sleeping on the ground or in the treetops for months, so sleeping in one felt like a luxury as well. The girls were already in the hot springs and were probably discussing something mundane. Shikamaru, however, was looking at the map that he had on his person and was scowling while sitting and crossing his arms. He had already removed his jounin vest and stretched his back a little. To his right, he saw Elfman sleeping soundly on his futon while Kiba and Akamaru kept watch just outside the hotel room. Shikamaru-san, what are you currently thinking right now? Lee asked all of a sudden. He was now wearing one of the inn's thin yukata to take in the cold night breeze. Just thinking of a plan to get in contact with the rest of our friends without drawing attention from our enemies and I have to be honest, this is tough. Currently, we have a fugitive on the loose, a madman with a doomsday weapon in God knows where, and a jinshiriki whose status we don't know. It's all quite difficult to think up a plan. That's like me saying that I have to play shogi without ever sacrificing one of my pieces, but also not knowing where my opponent will place his piece. Then how about we play, Shikamaru-san? Lee asked, and Shikamaru raised an eyebrow at this. Lee, this is not the time to be doing this. We need to get in contact with the rest as soon as possible, and we need to have a status on Naruto's condition. Lee then sat down and crossed his arms like Shikamaru was doing and said, Guy sensei told me once that in order to be an effective ninja, one must be willing to train hard and willing to take a rest when the time calls for it. I believe that those words hold truth in them. Shikamaru raised his eyebrow at this and said to the boy, You just believe whatever Guy sensei tells you. Of course. Guy sensei taught me everything that I needed to know. Shikamaru simply leaned back, and a half-lidded grin escaped his features. I guess I could play for a game or two. As Shikamaru and Lee began their game of wits in one room, the girls were in the hot springs, taking what they deemed as a relaxing bath. Finally, after months on the battlefield, we can relax with a warm bath. Ino exclaimed as she dipped herself into the steaming waters. I can't disagree there. We've been fighting for months, and this feels like a very welcome change of pace, Sakura commented. Months? You guys never had the chance for a break? Mira Jane asked incredulously. It was do or die, Mira. We couldn't exactly afford to give away the most important factor of the war into their hands, Tintin mentioned as she sat in the warm waters and stretched her tired muscles. You guys keep talking about this important factor so much. Just what is it that you need to have five nations guarding it to the teeth? Mira asked once more, and the shinobi became deadly silent. We can't exactly say it. Or to be more precise, we aren't allowed to say anything about it, Hinata answered for them. Although it wasn't obvious to many of the girls there, there was a certain distaste that left her mouth as she said so. She hated saying that word to describe Naruto. 
it was terribly demeaning for a person, and many of them knew just how it felt wrong for Hinata to describe him. Nevertheless, she would not let Naruto's existence as the Jinchuriki be compromised over this simple situation. What is it with you people and your secrets? Lee Sana asked with a frustrated sigh as she dunked half of her face into the water, leaving her eyes and nose on the surface. Sorry, it's just that this particular secret should be safeguarded from anyone. It's the only thing preventing the organization from total domination, and we don't want any more people looking for it. If we lose it, we lose the war, Sakura said in sincere apology as they all remained quiet. The awkward silence was present between the two groups. Obviously, it was not a subject they were comfortable discussing. Lee Sanna tried to change the subject. Wow, is that so? That must be really important then. How about we talk about what kind of magic do you people use then? The shinobi all looked at each other and then back to the mages and shrugged. Tintin was the one who answered. We can't tell you anything aside from what we already showed. It's because we like to keep our abilities a secret. Mira Jane was looking quite miffed at that. But then, she could understand from where they were coming. They weren't exactly friends to begin with. She just owed them after all. Then silence reigned in on their bath. When the girls were back in their rooms, they noticed that Shikamaru was on his knees and was pointing his finger at Rockley, who was sitting with his legs crossed on the floor. One more game. They looked rather curiously at this as they watched Shikamaru challenge lead to another round. Okay, what just happened here? Ino asked, because from the looks of it, Shikamaru looked like he had his but kicked in Shogi. By Lee of all people. Lee managed to win in our last round. He pulled off a good tactic earlier, and I somehow got my guard down. What? Ino asked, obviously finding it as such a big deal. Shikamaru had never lost in a game of Shogi against his peers. Not even once. So finding that Shikamaru lost this once, it was pretty hard to believe. That or Shikamaru was just as tired as them, but had to work twice as much. The Nara assumed the leadership position from that point on. Any decision making that they do would have to go through him first. The shinobi became aware of this as soon as they saw Shikamaru began playing a game of shogi against Rock Lee. He must be more tired than we thought. Sakura noticed as she saw Shikamaru's shoulders were slackened a little. And perhaps so, the Nara had to deal with a lot of things and he was aware of his responsibilities and had to keep his teammates in line. Particularly, Kiba's wily attitude on the way here and Ino's complaining. I guess I don't have to complain all the time. Ino muttered as they saw Shikamaru play. Several minutes later, Shikamaru was grinning when he had placed Lee in a checkmate. Lee was grinning as well. Has that relieved you of your stress, Shikamaru-san? Shikamaru gave a reply still grinning. Somehow, I never felt better. Hey guys, I just finished my night patrol. Lee, you're up. Kiba mentioned outside as Lee got up and arranged his yukata before going out. Shikamaru stretched once more and got up as well. I think I'll hit the baths now, Kiba's ears picked up. You are? I need one as well, so now is as good a time as any. Are the girls still in there? Kiba exclaimed with a blush on his face. Shikamaru just chuckled and shook his head. No, Kiba, they aren't. They were already out of the bath a few minutes ago. They're in their room right now, Shikamaru replied. Ah, man. I missed my chance. Kiba shouted in disappointment as he snapped his fingers. Kiba, do you remember that Sakura was with them? Yeah, so? Kiba was about to say a rude remark when he remembered what Naruto told him about Tsunade and Sakura's parallelism. The fact that they both have a very nasty temper and their super strength. Wordlessly, Kiba shuddered, and Akamaru had to chastise his master. This time, Shikamaru chuckled as the three of them entered the baths. Clover Town. It was early in the morning and at this time, Kakashi was the one who was gathering information on this new place that they were in while Guy was getting info on his own about any of their teammates. As he went around, he began asking some of the townsfolk that were bustling near the square for any sign of work. Currently, he was asking a really bulky man with a bald head about any jobs he could work for as a mercenary. From what he could deduce from the man, he was a carpenter or a craftsman. Mercenary? You mean like one of those mages for hire? Well, a lot of people will pay but you need to be a mage registered to a guild in order to take jobs. Though I suppose there are the simple odd jobs that you can do. Normally, tough works like monster extermination are handled by the guilds, the man explained, and Kakashi asked the man. Forgive me if I sound out of reason, but I would like to ask just what a guild is. The man looked at Kakashi incredulously and then asked him, You're not from around here, are you? Kakashi inwardly rolled his eyes at this. No. Well then, that explains it. All right, I'll answer it for you. A guild is a collection of mages that take odd jobs. They're basically legal freelancers that people hire in order to work for them, 
like what I said earlier about, such as monster extermination. They're sanctioned and controlled by the Magic Council in Era, a city far from Clover Town. Most of the missions range from simple menial chores to escorts, the man explained after he gave an exasperated sigh as Kakashi introduced another question. What about espionage and sabotage? Out of the question, lad. Only the council's very own mages can do that, and even then it's mostly in a time of warfare. And before you delve any deeper, assassinations are out of the question. The council frowns at the sight of any loss of human life. The man said as they made their way to a house being built. Or at least, that's what Kakashi thought. Hey, Cody, what the hell, man? What took you so long? The contractors would be here any hour to check out the house. We can't just stand here looking like hobos. We need to do our job. Another voice called out. When Kakashi turned to the person who was calling out his informant, he saw the complete opposite of what the man beside him was. A full head of hair and a scrawny build. Shut up for a moment, would you, Kyle? Some person was asking me questions about freelance work, and he was asking me if there was any person willing to take his services. The man beside Kakashi retorted. The white-haired Jounin simply nodded. Freelance work? Is he a mage? No, I'm not a mage. But I do have a set of skills unique for any specific job, Kakashi helpfully informed. Well then, ask the foreman for some work here. If you're not a mage, you must be some person down on his luck. I'm sure the foreman would appreciate the effort, though. We need all the help we can get to get this house up in a couple of months, and we're way behind schedule already, the man said. Kakashi nodded and went in the general direction of where the scrawny man pointed him. A few hours later, I found us some work, Kakashi mentioned as he informed the two adults who were already talking earlier. Really? I hope it's something exciting, Anko said in anticipation as Kakashi shook his head. Well, prepare to be disappointed, because it isn't what you think. While I was out there, I discovered we can't just do any type of mercenary work since we aren't mages working for a guild. Kakashi was interrupted as Anko asked, a guild? What the hell is a guild? It's something close to a ninja village, Anko. There are collective mages there who take freelance work every time. Right now, since we aren't registered and we would like to maintain a low profile, construction work would be best, Kakashi mentioned as Anko looked like she was about ready to curse. It can't be helped. Though this means we can finally put Naruto Kuin in a good hospital, Guy mentioned, and Kakashi nodded. By the way, how is he? He's still knocked out, as you can see. She pointed to the blonde rather sarcastically, then she continued, though I can't see anything wrong with him. He has a normal heartbeat, and his breathing isn't labored. He's still just unconscious. Normally, Naruto would have woken up by now. Kakashi mentioned this as he held his chin. Indeed, there was something wrong right now with the blonde. No other choice, I guess we're going to go to a local hospital, Kakashi said and carried Naruto on his back. The silver-haired Jounin inside once more as he remembered the younger days of Team 7. Melancholy escaped his features as they walked towards Clover Town, once again asking himself, how did it come to this? It was not only Kakashi who dreamt of his former team. Naruto's mindscape, an endless plethora of dreams invaded him, an endless stream of memories passed through. Naruto watched his memories of his childhood shimmered like water as he walked, looking back at them, trying to sort them out. My name is Uzumaki Naruto, and I like ramen and Sakura-chan. My dislikes are Sasuke team and waiting for five minutes for my ramen to cook. My dreams for the future are to become the greatest Hokage that ever was, surpassing even the Yandame. Then everyone will look at me and acknowledge me. Such a simple boy wanting to live a grand dream, to become the leader of his village, to be acknowledged by everyone, to have meaning in his life. It was all too simple, yet too complicated. Naruto smiled as he stopped and looked once more towards another scene. He saw himself crying as he stared at the boy who was impaled through the heart. How could you say that to him? He was your partner. He gave his life for you. You're a heartless bastard. Kid, your words cut deep, deeper than any blade. As the boy wept in front of him, Naruto simply looked on with a frown. A flow of uncertainty reached him. I am a relic they want to get rid of. So why do I exist and live? In order to exist, you need a purpose. To exist for no reason is the same as being dead. I would love only myself and fight for only myself. If all other people exist to magnify that love, then there is no more splendid universe than this one. Naruto turned his head to his back and there stood Gara. His eyes were like back then, full of hatred and bottled sadness. Naruto approached him and went to touch his shoulder, but the red-headed boy disintegrated and turned to dust, dancing into the wind and surrounding the blonde before fading away. What is going on with me? 
Naruto asked himself, looking at each of the memories he was living through. Hokage? Only fools would take up the mantle. Sarutobi Sensei was the same, a fool who followed a wistful dream. The blonde stopped at that but snorted in laughter in the end. It was somewhat ironic that the one who called the job of being Hokage a fool's job turned out to be the one to accept the title of Godame. Just shut up for once. What the hell do you know about it? It's not like you ever had a family in the first place. You were on your own right from the beginning. What makes you think you know anything about it? Huh. I'm suffering now because I had those ties. How on earth could you possibly understand what it feels like to lose all that? It was true. He didn't know what it was like to lose someone that important back then. But that was then, before Jiraiya was killed. He now understood how terrible that feeling was. Naruto looked down and sat for a moment. Reliving his past was something he wasn't fond of. Everything in them, no matter how much he tried, always seemed to go wrong. For another time, Naruto wished someone would give him an answer. Naruto just sat there, sitting on the rippling water, and reliving his memories as time moved forward without him. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content, click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.